I'm Umbreon Libris, and welcome back to Art School. I know everyone is talking Crown Tundra right now, but it's not out yet when I'm recording this, so give me a week. If you're new to Art School, you can check out the complete playlist here or click the link in the description. But the premise of the series is to go over the art styles of Pokemon pixel art and official art and talk about their main elements as well as techniques for how you can accomplish them. And to help demonstrate those techniques, I'm also creating a Fakemon family. We've covered all of the styles for Generations 1 and 2, so today we are covering the official art of the Game Boy Advance and DS eras. And once again, I've asked a guest lecturer to join me, someone who's made a career out of drawing Pokemon. My name is Marco, but you can call me Dark and Windy. That's my alias online. And I'm a Fakemon artist. been doing Fakemon for about... I'll say seven or eight years now. I actually truly started doing fake and mine when I, when I was about 10-ish. So, so that's 11 years back then. While Generations 1 and 2 had a pretty consistent watercolor style, there was a significant change for Generation 3 with the release of Ruby and Sapphire. And since then, the style has also stayed pretty consistent. But what I've learned throughout my studies is that it, for each two Sometimes generations, sometimes games, the art style sticks with it. Cause so with Gen One and Gen Two, okay. it stayed it stayed with the watercolor. Then for Gen Three, it started becoming more anime-ish, and then that's when he did redid really Fire Red Leaf Green's artwork as well. He did the same thing for Gen Four and Heart Gold Soul Silver. If we were to compare the art for Generation Three with what we see nowadays with the art for Sword and Shield, for example we see some significant differences. But since each new generation only makes small incremental changes to the style, if you're only comparing one generation to the next, like Gen 3 to Gen 4, for example, the differences are pretty small. And I'll try to talk about those differences, but for the purposes of this series, I'm basically dividing the generations into two. Today, we'll focus on generations three to five, roughly, and later on, we'll talk about the 3D era with generations six to eight. All right, that's enough of a preamble, so I think we should get started. As some of you guessed, today I'm creating an evolution for water. The fake mod design itself is not the focus of this series, so this isn't a super complex concept or anything. But since water was inspired by the giant river otter, I decided to make this evolution almost like a kaiju. And since the giant otter is a burrower, I figured I might as well give it the ground type, so it seemed fitting to reference Nidoking for the pose and proportions. The clawed work gloves reference the giant otter's large claws. The work boots are a callback to the vaguely boot-like feet that I gave the baby stage, Snotter. And the neck and chest pattern references the unique patterns giant otters have on their necks. The official art for Pokemon, especially back in the Gen 3-ish eras, was very static, and that was largely because of the poses, but also because of the line work, where everything has a very consistent thickness. The line thickness was us were usually very consistent, but nowadays he's he's implementing more dy dynamicism in a way. He's he's using he's becoming more thicker with some of his lines, and like to show he's coming at you like with Landorus and Thunderous and Tornadoes. You can see the tails literally just coming right at you. My studies have shown that Sugimori does his stuff on paper first, like as we've seen with the original 151 and 252 for for Gen 1 and Gen 2. He did he did it scan. I still believe he does that the same way. He does it all on paper and then. This time he scans it and does it digitally. Now I don't I don't use that same method. I don't implement that same method where you draw where you do it with pen and scan. I started to at the beginning, but it didn't work out that well for me. So instead, when I got my digital tablet, I just use I'll say the pen I use is a spread pen or a noise pen that gives you a little bit of the extra particle effect that you get when you, when you scan as well. Because if you look really close at the line work, you can see that there are some parts. That are really shaky and really you really show that you have done it with pen and the spread tool and the noise pen really they really do mimic that pretty well the pen brush i used here is the same one i used for the gen 1 artwork as well from when i did the digital watercolor imitation i just optimized the size relative to the drawing this will vary by canvas size but in my case it was only a six pixel diameter the color of the outline was also almost always pure black, with just a few exceptions like Swablu's wings, which uses blue outlines. But even then, it's just a flat color. They are not shaded. Where it gets a little bit weird is with color transitions on the body of the Pokemon. In most cases, patterns also get outlined in pure black, but in some cases, they don't get outlined at all. For example, to stay within the same generation, compare Makuhita's cheeks to Azuril. 
And in some rarer cases, there is an outline, but it's colored to make it a little bit more subtle, like with Azumarill. The choice between those styles seems pretty arbitrary, but since the majority of Pokemon art from this era uses pure black outlines even for the patterns, that's what I decided to do as well. After I play around with the colors for a moment, it's time to try the shading, which Wendy says is one of the most important aspects for getting that Pokemon look just right. The main thing is just the, the shading and the highlights, but like, like we just discussed a few moments ago, each generation had a different style of it that makes it look somewhat different, but it's still somewhat the same in a way. Like for instance, for Gen 3, the shading is more somewhat more blended and you can see that the tones are the tone of the shading is still somewhere close to the actual Pokemon's color. And the same for the highlights, things are kind of they're kind of bright, but they still work. They still blend together. For Gen 4, that's when you start seeing that I'll call it a bridge method where he uses he leaves a space between the original color and the rest of the shading. That that little line that's between the real color and the shading. That, that, that starts being implemented a bit more, but, that, but for Gen 4, it was thicker, and then the highlights pretty much remained the same. It blended some, but it, it wasn't really as blended. It just started being, becoming more loose. I wanted to get that bridge method just right, because to me, it's part of the classic Pokemon look. But in the past, I've always had trouble with it, so I asked Wendy how he does it. I've used three different styles throughout my time doing my designs. Because there's a lot of different ways that I've still been trying to figure out to do it the correct, the quote unquote correct way that gets it the closest to the real style. The first method, just flat color and then erase the edge. Try to and try your best to just make sure you go slow and make sure it's just as straight as possible. Make sure it's fine. I've used the watercolor style where... Well, not the, not the watercolor style that we know from Gen 1 and Gen 2, but the style where you go through one swipe and then go directly underneath it and just color the rest of that. That watercolor method or the layered shading style is the one that I tried before, but it's very difficult to keep the width of that intermediate band consistent throughout. I look at the artwork and see how smooth the transition is and how the shape of the shadow is, it remains constant. So, I'm, so I just sit there like, like, wait, how does he be, how does it become so straight and remain that way? when it's bending, twisting, turning. What I've been using more recently and has worked worked the best, I take a, I take a lighter color. I literally just draw where I, the outline of the sh of the shading and then I just fill it in with the paint with a paint bucket tool and then you just lower it and that's what that's what works for me. So that was the technique that I tried. I used a brush with lowered opacity to draw the shape of the shadows and then filled it with the full opacity on a separate layer. It's always in your best interest to just make sure you layer everything, each individual part when you're coloring, because you never know what's going to go wrong. <laughs> I've messed up a few times before in my past, and I, it, it, just, it was just annoying <laughs> to deal with. I had a small issue with my fills, though, where despite me having anti-aliasing turned on, the fills were too jagged. So I used a smudge tool that I normally use to blend watercolors to smoothen them out. Just something to keep an eye out for, depending on how you do this. The style of the highlights also varies a little bit from drawing to drawing, but usually it's got some layering of its own, and the edges seem to be partially erased with a semi-transparent brush. There's three, again, three methods. The watercolor part, I pretty much use the watercolor brush. I draw it out, and I just keep coloring it in. Other times, I just do it regularly with a flat brush, and I just erase it. Try, I do my best to just erase the way he does it when I, I just have to have some kind of reference, just see how how he did it. Sometimes it's hex hexagonal, sometimes it's rounded. It just depends on what the mm -hmm. texture is. Like sometimes for the trees, for, for when he did things like Trevenant and Torterra, I'm, I, I just look and I'm, and I'm just befuddled because it's like, wait, how am I supposed to do? A, then I just end up going with the watercolor and then just slowly and methodically just erase whatever I can to make, sh make it look close. There's also sometimes a very small spot of a very bright highlight. That's usually just for the extra focus part, just to, like you said, just to implement, show the, the direct light source, show how shiny it shiny is for the most part. It's usually only used for the rounded shapes that the, that the highlight is sitting on. Sometimes they're used for the spikes as, for spikes as well. The last thing we need to paint on is a texture. And that's really tricky because it can be so subtle to the point of being almost absent or it can be really obvious, but it's on every Pokemon art. 
like the texture is the main thing that I still haven't really figured out myself. Like I don't know the exact template, the exact textures that he uses, but apparently other people have figured it out. So I'm just, so I guess I'm just behind the curve on that one. So I just implement my own textures that I use. I think he uses, he does that just to give the Pokemon a more realistic feel. Like make make sure that you actually know that they they can be living amongst us, everything. Give it a, a a better feel, a natural a natural feel in a way. If you look real close, like for Gulp, and you can definitely see like it's cellular. It has a bit of a cellular type texture going on because it's a poison type, and I I guess cellular means poison. And then for others like the rock, most of the rock types or ground types, they have this dirt dirt particle effect that's going on. Like for hip powder on sand, I, I use paint to a side, so. The the tool it already comes with certain textures that you can use for your brushes. All I do I just use a, I just put on a new layer. I go over the part that I want the texture to be on, and then I either just overlay it or and reduce the opacity, and then that's that's the end of it. For my fake mon, since it's an otter, I decided to do something similar to Floatzel, which basically just has some very subtle striping that gives just a little bit more variation to the flat areas of color. I picked a lighter and brighter blue than what I used for the body, then just painted over the whole thing kind of haphazardly with a semi-transparent brush, then played around with the blending modes and opacity until I got something I was happy with. And there we go, this is Water's final stage, a water and ground type otter kaiju that, once again, I need your help to name. I think I got really close here, it's probably one of my best attempts at the Sugimori art style, so thank you, Dark and Windy. <clears throat> <laughs> it's a water? <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> Not the Pokemon. Thank you, Dark and Windy, for talking with me about the style and the techniques and your process. Hey, thanks for having me. If you like my work, you just follow me at, at Dark and Windy. You can check out my fake my fakemon at darkandwindyfakemon.wikia.com. And that's pretty, that's pretty much all there is to it. <laughs> if you're not already familiar with Windy's work, I absolutely recommend that you check it out. He's done a ton of work designing multiple generations worth of fakemon, so I'm sure there will be something that you like. Thank you for watching. If you used what you learned today, I would love to see what you come up with. And thank you, of course, to my patrons who helped me keep this channel going, especially luxury patron Ethan from Chicago. I'll see you in the next chapter. <laughs> well, I said I'm hungry on Libras at the beginning. I figured I didn't have to say it again. Who did you? I don't know. <laughs>